traveling through women's history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. You're running through the trees. It's nighttime, and you're sprinting through darkness with nothing to guide you but the stars overhead. You've run away from a place that is both home and your prison, leaving behind all you love and all you know. You don't know what lies ahead of you. You only know that you will never go back, unless they catch you. Dogs howl and bay through the woods. You can almost hear your name in their voices, howling for your blood. But still you run, harder and harder, because you're running for your freedom, for your life. Terror, desperation, wild, reckless hope. Can you feel it? Trouble, trouble, trouble all about my soul. Harriet Tubman and Elizabeth Keckley were both born into bondage and suffered under the yoke of everything the institution of slavery promised. Like millions of other black women in 19th century America, they were victims of a terrible system. And they were also so much more than that. Survivors, fighters, thinkers, dreamers. These courageous women eventually found lives of freedom, though to get there, they took vastly different paths. One ran away, becoming one of the only black female conductors on the Underground Railroad, daring to go back into the South to liberate those still in chains. The other worked hard to buy her freedom, becoming a successful business owner who dressed some of the era's most illustrious and powerful women. During the Civil War, one helped execute a daring fly-by-night raid that struck a terrible blow to the Confederacy, while the other became a key behind-the-scenes member in Abe Lincoln's White House, using her influence to start a relief organization to help others. These women share certain storylines, and they diverge wildly in others. But in weaving their lives together, a picture forms of what life was like for an enslaved woman in America, from their time in bondage to the opportunities and trials that came after it. I'm no expert on slavery and race in America, and I'm sure my coverage of these women's lives will have flaws. But we can't ignore or skip over these stories, because the Explorers is all about time traveling back to walk in many different women's shoes to try and understand what it was like to be them in their time and place. I don't profess to truly know what it was to be an enslaved woman in America, but I want to try to. Harriet and Elizabeth did incredible things, made all the more so because of the mountains they had to climb to get there. In our first two-part episode, let's sink into their stories. Grab your sewing kit, some sturdy shoes, and a will of iron. Let's go traveling. Let's start in 1818, the year Elizabeth is born. Here's where we're at with slavery. England's gearing up to end their system. In Haiti, the enslaved have risen up against their French oppressors and won, becoming the first country founded by the formerly enslaved. In America, the abolition movement is picking up steam and the international slave trade has officially ended. And yet the institution only seems to be growing more deeply entrenched in the southern and western states. It's woven into the fiber of the American way of life. How did America get here? How did slavery become such a prominent piece of the country's fabric and so intensely tied to race? From the very beginning of colonial America, we were laying the foundations for what 19th century Americans called the peculiar institution. The slave trade goes back as far as 1619, but it wasn't absent one day, then there the next. Colonists didn't all decide together, hey, you know what would be neat? Like most of history's worst horrors, it crept in like the kind of insidious fog that you don't really notice until it's blinded you. One colony, one law, and one judge at a time. The colonies needed people to work the fields to get things going, and that often meant women had to go out and work. This was a problem for 17th century colonials because it violated the social and familial order they subscribed to. It was a man's job to protect his women, both physically and financially, making it possible for them to stay at home in the domestic sphere. Ah, that old chestnut. 
But more than that, they were also seen as having poor moral standing. Common wenches who spent the day outside in the public sphere. A tan in this century is not desirable. So as white colonial women moved into the house and more and more colored women, Native Americans, Africans, and others, moved into the fields, physical work, moral standing, and skin color started to become weirdly entangled, which, as we'll see soon, did not bode well for women in the fields. To fill the fields with people to till it, Europeans hired indentured servants. People from all over the place of many skin colors, almost always poor and sometimes criminals, who agreed to work off a several year period of servitude in exchange for passage to America, room, and usually meager board. Conditions could be quite bad, but this wasn't slavery. Indentured servitude had an end date with the promise of land and eventual freedom in sight. Many of the first Africans brought over to America were treated like indentured servants. So, not like royalty by any means, but with at least the same meager rights and the chance of freedom at the end of it. In the beginning, being black in America didn't always mean being a slave, although that possibility was always looming. African Americans owned land, married who they liked, made fortunes. But indentures were becoming more expensive. Disasters in Europe like the English Civil War meant that indentured servants were needed back in the motherland. Plus, indentures were uppity, starting rebellions over better work conditions, and eventually posed as competition for the more established. And there was this other thing. White indentures were having mixed-race children with African indentures. And that was really rocking the system, and confusing everybody about who was who. The more black colonials tried to use the law to gain some power, converting to Christianity because the law said they couldn't be enslaved then, say, the more stringent and race-based the laws became. In 1656 in Virginia, a woman named Elizabeth Key fought her way up the legal chain and sued for her freedom based on who her father was, a white Englishman, and she won. For some people, this posed a serious problem. So in colonies like Virginia, which several of America's founding fathers called home, black women's work was taxed while white women's wasn't. Black men weren't allowed to carry firearms, all of which made it harder to escape a life of servitude. Why do this? Because, in short, the colonists were greedy, slaves were cheaper than indentured servants, and, bonus, slaves could never leave you, and they just keep making you more. Yikes. These laws also ensured that as indentured servitude started to fall by the wayside, slavery became a race-based system, something that, through most of history, it never was before. First, because places like Eastern Europe had started putting up walls that made it hard to kidnap people. But in Africa, there were no such walls. And while Native Americans were also enslaved by the colonists, keeping them that way made for an uneasy relationship with the free tribes around you. Africans in America had no one to fight for them. Colonists use all sorts of arguments for this system, all of them tough for us to swallow. That it was the natural order of things, that the Bible said so. But it seems to me that race-based slavery took hold over time because it made it very easy to see who was who at a glance, to judge and control them. And thus, by the mid-1650s, the colonies were starting to embrace it. With the rise of the rice crop in the South, that part of America was the most enthusiastic of all. But when it came time to break from ye old Mother England, the founding fathers, and mothers behind the scenes, were in a bit of a pickle. Some of them recognized that slavery was not the world's greatest system, but the economy ran on it, so what to do? The Constitution ended up saying that the federal government couldn't interfere with slavery at the state level. It also allowed for a three-fifths rule, that is, three-fifths of each state's enslaved population would be counted toward a state's representation in Congress. The greater the state's slave numbers, the more power they're going to have in politics. I guess that's why almost all of America's first 16 presidents were Southern slaveholders. Sweet job, Thomas Jefferson! At the turn of the 18th century, we see the introduction of a game-changing invention, the cotton gin. 
When young Yale graduate Eli Whitney went down to Georgia to become a private tutor, his quick mind saw an opportunity. Tobacco was declining as a cash crop, and as a rule, cotton wasn't yet all that profitable. Long staple cotton fluff was easy to pull out of its seed pods, but that was only along the coast. The harder stuff that grew in land was spiky, sticky, and really hard to process at a quick enough pace to make any real money. So the inventive Eli got to work on an idea. A machine that automatically sorted seeds and other bits out from the cotton, meaning that it could be processed way faster than before. In 1800, the production of raw cotton doubled in yield, as it did every year after that. And that converts, for some, to serious money. This had such a profound impact on the American economy that every American kid learns about the cotton gin in school. But I'll bet you never learned that Eli's main backer was a woman. Catherine Green, his employer, encouraged Eli and gave him money for his project. Oh, Catherine, I wish you hadn't. Because the result for enslaved people was devastating. Though the machine made processing faster and took out the need for human labor, you still needed people to manually pick the crop. And with those doubling yields, they needed lots of people. There were real fortunes to be made, and as per usual, economic gain trumped morality. The slave trade boomed, spreading out across the South and West. In 1790, there were six so-called slave states, or states that allowed for slavery. By the Civil War 70 years later, there were 15. Between 1790 and 1808, some 80,000 people were stolen from Africa and sold into slavery. I'm just going to let that number hang here for a minute. The cotton gin helped create what we picture when we think of the antebellum South, that long-porched plantation surrounded by live oaks, Spanish moss, and fields full of enslaved women of color. And on that depressing note, let's join our leading ladies. There are some dark chapters ahead, my friends, but stick with me. These stories will make us appreciate these women's triumphs that much more. Somebody's calling Elizabeth Hobbs was born in February 1818 in Dinwiddie County, Virginia. I had a friend in college who grew up there too, and so I keep wanting to pronounce it the way he did. Dinwiddie. But anyway. Lizzie was the daughter of Aggie Hobbs and George Pleasant Hobbs. At least, George was her father of record. The man whom she called her father and who raised her lovingly as his own. Her biological father was Armistead Burwell, her white owner. Let's put that term in air quotes for the duration, shall we? Though Lizzie didn't know that until she was older. Mother Aggie was also the product of such a union with a white man. So already, we're in some deeply troubling waters. Let me hit you with some law real quick. Back in the 1600s, there were some huge legal shifts that directly affect both of our heroines in a major way. And they all seem to reflect white people's deep anxieties about interracial coupling. First, we've got America's first anti-miscegenation laws. Woo, that's hard to say. Which made interracial marriage illegal. Virginia and Maryland, where Harriet and Elizabeth were born, were two of the first colonies to put this particular gem into practice. But hey, don't worry, white guys. These laws aren't really aimed at you. It's white women getting involved with black men that we're chiefly concerned about here. The reason for this seems to be, as the Virginia law states, for prevention of that abominable mixture and spurious children. And as the Maryland law states, to keep women from making such shameful matches. Why are we so worried about this? Well, because the 18th century saw a big uptick in interracial children, and they seem to threaten white power in a way that makes those in charge very anxious. How to tell who is who with all this mixing and melding? How to keep such children from rising up and killing us all? The law stated that if you, a white woman, had children with a black man, you'd be forced to pay 15 pounds sterling or risk you and your child being forced into indentured servitude. Dear me. Eventually, the laws forbade any white person from marrying any black person, free or not. And these laws didn't totally go away until the 1960s. Ugh, America. 
But there are laws aimed at curbing white men's appetites as well. In a society where before status always stemmed from the father, these broke the mold, saying instead that a child's status would always follow the status of their mother, partis sequitur ventrum. This was meant to keep white men from getting involved with black women, as any kids born of that union would automatically be enslaved. But did that stop white men from doing what they wanted? Not really. In fact, it freed them of any responsibility or punishment for having mixed-race children out of wedlock. While for the enslaved, these laws made slavery a system that ran from cradle to grave. Let's put this in perspective concerning Elizabeth Keckley. While Lizzie's father, and probably her grandfather, were both white and free, Lizzie is enslaved, not considered a member of his family. She has no rights to his property. She is a slave, and that is all. Her mother Aggie is the family seamstress, and mammy, or nurse, to children who are, lest we forget, Lizzie's half-siblings. I mean, what? Her father George dearly loves Lizzie and her mother, but is actually owned by another man and lives elsewhere. Like all marriages between enslaved people, it isn't legally binding. The law doesn't demand the Burwells honor it, which means that married couples have to fight to be together, and the threat of separation is never far from their minds. Both parents can read and write, and they teach their daughter as well, though it's hard to say where they learned it from. It's illegal in the South for them to learn, considered a threat to the institution of slavery. And it is a threat. Education is power, and depriving people of learning is a means of keeping them in chains. I have found that to make a contented slave, it is necessary to make a thoughtless one, said Frederick Douglass, who escaped from a plantation not all that far from Harriet Tubman's. It is necessary to darken his moral and mental vision, and as far as possible, to annihilate the power of reason. He must be able to detect no inconsistencies in slavery. He must be made to feel that slavery is right, and he can be brought to that only when he ceased to be a man. But many enslaved people fight to learn anyway. In Savannah, Georgia, a young woman named Susie King, who we talked about in Episode 2 on Civil War Nurses, openly defies these harsh laws by attending secret schools run by black women and seeking out help from two white teens. Just so you know, defying such laws will be punished a la The Handmaid's Tale. Seriously, think about that next time you pick up a book in your leisure time. The Burwell family's fortunes are variable. Armistead Burwell and his five sisters lost money in the financial downturn of 1819, just after Lizzie was born, and he had to sell the estate, some land, and some property. And what counted as property? You guessed it. At age four, Lizzie is assigned to rock the cradle of the family's new baby. Her half-sister, though of course no one's about to point that out, and who is also named Elizabeth. Um, but as a four-year-old babysitter is wont to do, she rocks the cradle a little too hard. The baby comes tumbling out and Lizzie panics. She isn't sure if she's allowed to touch the baby or not, so she grabs the fireplace shovel and tries to scoop up her charge. Mr. Spurwell walks in on this absurd scene and goes completely bonkers. Elizabeth is punished with a whipping at four years old. The blows were not administered with a light hand, I assure you, she writes later. And the doubtless the severity of the lashing has made me remember the incident so well. A few years after Lizzie is born, some 250 miles to the north on the eastern shore of Maryland, Araminta Ross is born. But her family calls her Minty. We don't know exactly what year she was born. Harriet thought it was 1825, but her gravestone says 1820. Bad record keeping is one of the many legacies slavery left on the people who suffered under it. So much of their history isn't written down because they aren't allowed to learn how. We don't know much about her family's lineage, except that her maternal grandmother was born in Africa and brought over on a slave ship, probably from around the Ivory Coast. Unlike Lizzie, Era Minta never learns to read or write, even as an older, free woman. But she can tell a riveting story with the best of them. Some more law knowledge for you. In 1820, right around when Harriet's born, America sees the signing of the Missouri Compromise. 
As the country expanded and new states formed, there's been growing tension about whether new states would be allowed to join as slave or free. Such is the case with Missouri. It wants into the Union as a slave state, but that's a problem. Right then, America is balanced 50-50 in terms of freed versus enslaved states. And the government doesn't want to upset that equilibrium. Because slavery is wrong and they want it to fade away into the night, you say? Well, some do, but sadly, that isn't the main driver. It's that such an imbalance might give slave owners the winning hand in Congress. So a compromise is struck. Let Missouri in as a slave state while admitting Maine as a free state. But also, let's just draw a line in the sand and say that from now on, slavery can't expand north of the 36-30 parallel. Red Rover, Red Rover, don't bring slavery right over. Now everyone is happy, right? Oh no. A lot of people see it as a terrible omen. Our good buddy Thomas Jefferson wrote that it, like a firebell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it the death knell of the Union. Well, Jeff, maybe you should have sorted this out properly when you signed the Constitution, instead of fathering several children with an enslaved woman. Just saying. This compromise further divided the country into North and South, making slavery a Southern thing and freedom a Northern one. For both Harriet and Lizzie, this law further chains them to the institution of slavery. It's as if the federal government drew a line in the sand and said, you down there, this is just the way it is. Sorry about it. Maryland's eastern shore is very close to the Mason-Dixon line, the dividing line between the North and the South. But to Minty, the North might as well be another planet. Araminta is born on or around the Brodess Plantation. Her mother is Harriet Green, also called Rit, and her father is one Benjamin Ross. Rit is owned by Joseph and Mary Pattison Brodess, while Ben belongs to their neighbor, Anthony Thompson. Not long after Joseph died in 1803, Mary and Anthony got hitched, merging their lands and properties. That included Rit and Ben, just your average morally corrupt Brady Bunch. But that's how Rit and Benjamin met and fell in love. Minty is born somewhere in the middle of a long line of siblings. Her parents love their children deeply. Minty remembered having a cradle lovingly made for her out of a gum tree, probably by her woodsman father. Her mom is a cook for the Brodess family, and given Harriet's later skill with herbs and cookery, probably teaches her daughter all she knows. But in 1822, she suffers a blow. She loses her father. Mary Brodess's son from her first marriage, Edward, has come of age and gotten married, taking all of his property with him. And what counts as property? Yep, written her children. Now that these parents officially have different owners, they constantly have to negotiate to try and keep their family together. Always, there's the threat of seeing a family member leave you, never to be seen again. Separation by sale happens more and more after the international slave trade ends in 1807. Because American landowners still need workers, and if they can't get them off a boat, they'll get them from other American plantations. My Lord, no more. My The domestic slave trade becomes big business, many of them coming from upper southern states like Maryland that don't rely so much on cotton. One unfortunate consequence is that white men have all the incentive in the world to get their enslaved women making babies. Despite very harsh conditions in the South for enslaved people, their population rises from 2 million in 1808 to 3.5 million less than 50 years later. Harriet's locality is a prime place for so-called Georgia traders to come looking to buy farmhands, especially young ones. In the first half of the 19th century, 10% of teenage slaves in the Upper South are sold. Another 10% are sold in their 20s. Imagine the terror of seeing a child or a sibling sold away down south. That's what happens to two of Harriet's older sisters. All her life, she remembers watching them be carried away, kicking and screaming, their faces twisted with terror. Harriet never sees them again, and this loss haunts her for the rest of her life. It almost happens to her brother Henry, too. But when Rit happens to see Joseph Brodess take money from a Georgia man, Rit takes action. When Brodess calls Henry to the house, she goes instead. Annoyed, he asks why she's come when it was Henry he called for. 
And so she accuses him flat out of wanting to sell her son. Though Brodas tries to find the boy, Rit keeps Henry hidden in the woods with some friends for more than a month. He tries to rope another slave into setting a trap for the boy, but again, Rit blocks him. The first man to come into my house, she said, I will split his head open. It's an incredibly brave thing to do, and it saves Henry. In that moment, Rit shows her daughter the importance of fighting for family and what you know in your heart is right. Despite everything, some of Harriet's early memories of this place are happy ones. There's the one about her beautiful cradle. She also remembers some white girls playing with her, throwing her laughing up into the air. Which makes you wonder, at what age would the reality of slavery have sunk in for Lizzie and Harriet? How early do you think you'd have to realize what your life would be? That life is hard. Old Alabama Viewed as a commodity, the enslaved are often given enough food to eat, but it's mostly pork and corn, and thus they're surviving, but not thriving. While having children is encouraged, pregnant women are often forced out into the fields shortly after giving birth. Fanny Kemble, a slaveholder's wife down in Georgia, complained that her husband sent women back into the fields only three weeks after birth. Though frankly, that's probably a longer recovery than many got. They often have to take their infants out to work with them. Fanny reported that one of these infants was bitten by a snake and died. In both Maryland and Virginia, the swampy conditions in summer means the spread of many diseases, like malaria and yellow fever, and very little medical assistance. The infant mortality rate for black children is some two times higher than for white ones. So is the risk of miscarriage from others. No surprise when you consider the bad food and shoddy living conditions these women are dealing with. More often than not, the enslaved tend to their own sick and pregnant, using their knowledge of roots and herbs passed down through generations. Some black women midwives deliver white babies as well. They use what comes to hand, sassafras tea to search the blood for what's ailing you, chestnut leaf tea for asthma, mint and cow manure tea for consumption. Yummy. The enslaved bring seeds and roots with them across the Atlantic, spreading them and their uses through the South. Like okra, for example. Southern cuisine owes a lot to African plants and techniques. There is power in tending to your own community's ailments, and a healer on a plantation is an almost holy thing. A deep knowledge of the land and a spiritual connection to it is something Harriet feels from an early age. When Harriet is five, she gets her first job, which is strikingly similar to Lizzie's. She is loaned out to a neighbor. This is a common practice where a slave is contracted out to someone else. Yes, much like you'd hire out a lawnmower from the hardware store. Classy. This neighbor, a Miss Susan, wants someone to look after her baby. You're going to let her take care of your baby? At five years old? The whole thing almost feels like a setup. But still, Minty has to take care of that baby and do a full load of domestic work, all while homesick and missing her family, at five years old. Do you remember being five? If the baby cries, she is whipped. One day, she's whipped five times before breakfast. She carries the scars of it for the rest of her life. She's resourceful, though. She wears thick clothes and pretends the whippings hurt as they're administered. She's feisty, too. Once, while being punished, she bites a man's knee. Yes, Minty! When she finally returns home, she's weak, sick, malnourished. Rit nurses her back to health. But she is loaned out again, and again, and again. She does all sorts of chores, all of them grueling. Breaking flax, for example, and wading into waist-high water to catch muskrats. What do you even do with a muskrat? Eat it? Skin it and make a fancy muff? At age seven, Araminta finds the lure of a nearby sugar bowl a little too tempting. The mistress finds her with her hand in the cookie jar. Knowing she'll be punished, she runs, hiding in a pig pen for five days, fighting the pigs for the scraps. Imagine having to survive like that, being treated like that. I grew up like a neglected weed, she said later. Ignorant of liberty, having no experience of it. Then I was not happy or contented. Slavery is the next thing to hell. 
my God in all I Meanwhile, Lizzie's suffering similar trials. One year, her father's owner moves away because of his failing fortunes, taking George away with him. It doesn't matter that he doesn't want to go. What he wants doesn't count. I can remember the scene as if it were but yesterday, Lizzie recalled. How my father cried about the cruel separation, his last kiss, his wild straining of my mother to his bosom, the solemn prayer to heaven, the tears and sobs, the fearful anguish of broken hearts. Though they write letters back and forth, and George swears he'll find a way to come back to them, Lizzie and Aggie never see him again. When Aggie weeps openly about it, the lady of the house just says, For heaven's sake, Aggie, there are plenty of men out there. If you want a husband so badly, go and find another. Mrs. Burwell doesn't like to see their slaves walking around looking all mopey, probably because it would force her to, you know, accept the reality of her terribleness. That the women who serve her are actually human beings with feelings. Hmm. So Aggie and Lizzie and all enslaved women learn how to hide and shove down their feelings. Alas, Lizzie wrote later, The sunny face of the slave is not always an indication of sunshine in the heart. Southern plantation owners spend a lot of time being fearful about what thunderstorms might be brewing in the hearts of the people sweeping their hearth and cooking their breakfasts. And with good reason. The history of slave rebellions in America goes all the way back to 1676. Southern Belle Mary Chestnut writes several times in her diary about such an uprising. She grew up with stories of slaves killing masters. If they want to kill us, they can do it when they please. We ought to be grateful that any one of us is alive. In 1831, one Nat Turner and a group of other enslaved people rise up against their owners in Southampton, Virginia. The uprising lasts for days, resulting in the murder of some 51 white people. It's the only truly successful slave revolt in U.S. history, though it certainly isn't the only one. And it sends serious shockwaves through the South. With each revolt comes more restrictive laws meant to suppress them prohibiting black people from learning to read, from gathering to worship, or gathering to do anything at all but work. As Lizzie grows, her mother teaches her a valuable skill, sewing. A skill like that means being what is called a house servant. Though Minty will come to loathe such work, it's generally less physically grueling than being out in the fields. Aggie would have been in charge of making all of the family's clothes and the slaves' clothes in a time when sewing is still done by hand, so she's not exactly living that luxe life up at the big house. Having her daughter to lend a helping hand would have really helped alleviate the burden. Plus, it also means that she's less likely to be sold away. And though Lizzie is repeatedly told when even 14 years old that I would never be worth my salt. She takes to the work, becoming a very skilled seamstress, and that will change the course of her life. Eventually, Lizzie is loaned out to her half-brother Robert. Yup, you heard that right. He's married a girl named Anna and needs help setting up his own house. He's a pretty useless husband, it seems, leaving Anna in a less than prestigious situation. Elizabeth is embarrassed by it, too. This assignment is a step down for her. Anna resents what she sees as Lizzie's lack of deference. So often, she aims her frustration Lizzie's way. She is screamed at, belittled, hit, you name it. But apparently, that still isn't enough. One day, Lizzie is loaned out to a neighbor, a Mr. Bingham, who tells her to take down her dress for a whipping. She bravely demands to know why. I was 18 years of age, she said, was a woman fully developed, and yet this man coolly bade me take down my dress. I drew myself up proudly, firmly, and said no, Mr. Bingham. She says that he'll have to be stronger than she is if he wants to beat her. Unfortunately, he is. He beats her terribly. And when she stumbles home and asks why they sent her for a whipping, Robert hits her again. The beatings from Bingham go on, with no one to stop them. Because in the eyes of the law, this is discipline, not abuse. My spirit rebelled against the unjustness that had been inflicted upon me, she said. And though I tried to smother my anger and to forgive those who had been so cruel to me, 
it was impossible. And yet Lizzie fights to hold on to her spark, her spirit, her sense of worth. I told him I was ready to die, but that he could not conquer me. Finally, Mr. Bingham feels guilty enough that he stops, saying it's a sin to hit her. You think, Bingham? Go choke slowly on something. But Robert doesn't get the memo. All Lizzie can do is write sorrowful letters to her mother, to which Aggie can do nothing but send her love back. This is, needless to say, a bleak time for Lizzie. And I hate to say it, but it's about to get worse. Trouble, Lord, I'm trouble. Around this time, Lizzie is repeatedly raped by a white man named Alexander Kirkland. Angry at his failing fortunes and increasingly to be found wandering around on drunk tirades, this giant of a man keeps finding Lizzie. And though people know about it, they do nothing. For four years. Rape is one of slavery's best worst-kept secrets. It isn't something one talks about, but mixed-race children are everywhere you look, laws be damned. And while of course not all Southern men participated, it was widespread enough that Mary Chestnut wrote, Like the patriarchs of old, our men live all in one house with their wives and their concubines, and the mulattoes one sees in every family exactly resemble the white children, and every lady tells you who is the father of all the mulatto children in everybody's household. But those in her own, she seems to think drop from the clouds, or pretends so to think. Here's how former enslaved woman Harriet Jacobs put it in her memoir. Women are considered of no value unless they continually increase their owner's stock. They are put on a par with animals. How do we even begin to fathom this? Remember that 1662 law that said a child's status follows the status of its mother? What it really means is that it follows the status of the black mother. And remember that all people born into slavery are seen as another commodity to sell and work. And that means that white men have nothing but encouragement, legally, to rape their slaves. They don't see it as rape at all. These are extremely murky waters we're swimming in, and difficult ones for a time traveler to swim through. I'm sure there were relationships between white men and black women that involved true romantic feelings. But you can still argue that any relationship between an enslaved person and a free one is exploitative by nature. The power imbalanced in a major way. And you wouldn't be wrong. But here's what truly gets me. How can white men watch their child grow up in enslavement? How can their wives watch women being treated like this and not stop it? We'll delve into that more in another episode. Let's say that the blame for such couplings is almost always laid on the black woman in question. My Lord, no more. Take what happens in 1850 when a man named Robert Newsom buys a teenage girl named Celia. He builds her a private sex cabin and abuses her for years, resulting in several children, until a pregnant Celia has finally had enough. A fight ensues, during which she hits Newsom over the head and kills him, then feeds him into her giant fire. It's clearly self-defense, but the court convicts her, partially because her lawyer won't say out loud that she's been raped. Property can't be raped now, can it? She's condemned to hang and does, because letting her go would give her humanity and challenge the entire establishment. What I'm saying here is that, if you're a woman in this situation, you have next to no way to fight it. And that, as former slave Harriet Jacobs writes, there are wrongs which even the grave does not bury. Back to Lizzie. By 24, she has a child by this man, whom she names, quite sweetly, George Pleasant Hobbs. Despite his origin story, she loves her son to pieces, and she will do anything to make him free. Back in Maryland, age 12, Araminta is officially over the domestic life. While Elizabeth Keckley finds her salvation in sewing, Minty hates being so closely supervised and cooped up for so much of the day. Though she's short, just five feet, she's strong and grows stronger as she works with her brothers in the fields. The labor is by no means easy, but it helps her build up strength and stamina. 
She loves nature, and from an early age, she sees God in it. As a teen, Minty is loaned out to a man named Barrett. When an enslaved man she's working with leaves the property without permission, the overseer goes in hot pursuit. Minty races ahead to warn the man, as he might be punished as a runaway. As Barrett tries to get at the man to whip him, she throws herself between them. You can imagine what happens next. He picks up a lead weight and hits her with it in what she recalls as a stunning blow. She said it broke my skull and cut a piece of that shawl clean off and drove it into my head. They carried me to the house all bleeding and fainting. I had no bed, no place to lie down on at all, and they laid me on the seat of the loom. And I stayed there all that day and the next. For weeks, Harriet slips between sleeping and waking, falling in and out of a kind of trance. Modern scholars think she must have had narcolepsy or cataplexy, but Minty's family wouldn't have known that. For the rest of her life, she'll have visions and long, trance-like sleeping spells that fall upon her without warning. She has a recurring nightmare about riders coming in and stealing children from their parents. She also has one about being free. <laughs> Flying over fields and towns and rivers and mountains, looking down upon them like a bird. At last, reaching a great fence or sometimes a river. And just as I was sinking down, there would be ladies all dressed in white over there. And they would put out their arms and pull me across. On the upside, it feels to her like these visions are sent straight from God. From now on, she feels firmly that the Lord is there and guiding her. Oh, when I come to die. She's sick in bed for months. Finally, when she's well enough, she goes to work for a man named John Stewart, along with her father and brothers, at his lumber yard. Her father actually earns enough from this work to buy his freedom, but he doesn't. That only comes much later. Why? Because he doesn't want to leave his family. This is yet another way that people of color are kept in bondage. In most states, freed slaves had to carry about freedom papers at all times or risk being put back into slavery. Some states even have laws that force freed people to leave within a certain number of months of being free, which often means leaving their families. Around 1844, Minty marries a free black man named John Tubman though they don't have any children together. It's hard to know why, but it's worth pointing out again that any children of theirs would have been born into slavery. Or maybe it's that, if she didn't have children within a few years to provide some extra holdings for her owner's wealth, he might choose a different, more productive husband for her. Yikes. Meanwhile, she finds some way to see a lawyer about a suspicion that's been forming in her head, that there was language in her former mistress's will that said, vaguely, that her mother Rich should have been freed when she turned 45. But with the watery wording, the lawyer basically says it isn't worth trying to fight for. Such a fight against her owners would probably only end in tears. Understandably, this is deeply upsetting to Araminta. Her mother has been living in slavery for an extra decade. It only underlines her resolve to get free. She blames her owner, Brodess, for keeping her and her family in bondage. First, she prays to change his heart, but when she hears rumors that he's going to sell her and perhaps her brothers too, she changed my prayer. And I said, Lord, if you ain't never gonna change that man's heart, kill him, Lord, and take him out of the way so he won't do no more mischief. And then he does die, and she feels a bit guilty about it, but I sure don't. With that death comes true upheaval. Will she and her family be sold, separated? Should she risk running away or stay with them? Should she leave her husband, who doesn't want to go north? Of this time in her life, she said, I had reasoned this out in my mind. There was one of two things I have a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. For no man should take me alive. I should fight for my liberty as long as my strength lasted. And when the time came for me to go, the Lord would let them take me. And so it is that, in 1849, she runs. So here we are again, 
running through a midnight wood, with bloodhounds not too far behind. When I was young, I always pictured the system that enslaved people traveled to get from south to north, the Underground Railroad, as, you know, a railroad. Everyone shuffled between organized stations in my head, with conductors wearing jaunty hats. But it wasn't really an official or highly organized network, but a loose and shifting system. I guess I could be called a conductor of the Underground Railway, only we didn't call it that then, said Arnold Gragston, who helped ferry his brethren across a river in Kentucky to freedom for four years before he finally did it himself. I don't know as we called it anything. We just knew there was a lot of slaves always wanting to get free, and I had to help them. Over time, the Underground Railroad has taken on a misty, romanticized quality, as has Harriet Tubman herself. To understand what Minty is about to go through, we have to wave some of that mist away. We don't know when the term Underground Railroad first came into being. It was used as early as the 1830s, when a young enslaved man quoted in a newspaper said he hoped to escape on the railroad that he heard went underground all the way to Boston. Sometimes it was organized, and there were code names for the people and places involved. There were stations, or houses, that were often to take in runaways, as well as station masters who ran them, and conductors who ushered fugitives from place to place. You'll often hear that a lot of white people were involved in the Underground Railroad. That's not untrue. There were plenty of white-run vigilance committees in the North who raised money to help them, and people in the South who helped operate safe houses and transportation, though it was illegal to do so. Araminta Ross supposedly gave a white woman a quilt in exchange for her help in the beginning of her journey. But in Maryland especially, it was common knowledge that there were pockets of free blacks she could turn to. The fact that there were so many freed people living there made it easier to blend into the crowd as you escaped. The truth is that the vast majority of the people involved in the Underground Railroad and taking the real risks were black. And really, if you're Araminta, who are you going to stop and ask for directions? Who are you going to trust your life to? That white guy who might or might not be a Quaker, or someone who looks like you. Another truth to consider, most of the people who escaped from slavery didn't do so in big groups or with their families. Most were young men, and they escaped alone. In a record of fugitives compiled in 1855, the vast majority were men around the age of 25. That's partially because most of these escapes probably weren't meticulously planned, People saw opportunities arrive when they were loaned out, and sometimes had to grab them when they saw them. But it's also because escaping is really hard. The more people you bring with you, particularly the elderly or children, the less likely you are to make it out without someone finding you. Especially with slave wanted ads cropping up in local papers, offering rewards for your safe return. Araminta's owner put out one such ad. Minty, aged about 27 years, is of a chestnut color, fine-looking, and about five feet high. It offered $50 if she was found in Maryland, and $100 if found outside that state. It was like a missing kid milk carton, out there for everyone to see. What makes it harder is that most fugitives have no idea exactly where they're going, or how far they'll have to run before they get to safe ground. Every day out on the road makes it more likely that you'll be caught. It's telling that most of the people recorded in that record of fugitives were originally from Maryland and Virginia, which were closest to the Mason-Dixon line. Very few enslaved people escape from the Deep South. When you're taken away by a Georgia man, it's like a death sentence. You're unlikely to ever get out of there, and too scared of the consequences to try. Some people are so afraid of being captured that they find other ways to get themselves up north. After his wife and kids are sold away from him in Richmond, Virginia, a man named Henry Box Brown comes up with a plan. He pays a white man named Samuel Redboot Smith to pack him up in a crate even smaller than a coffin and ship him up to Philly. Yes, he literally FedExed himself to freedom. One hopes someone cut some air holes into that box. When he arrives 250 miles and 24 hours later, the man who opened his box asks, All right? And he says, All right, sir. This story is insane and kind of amazing, but also sobering. 
Imagine being so desperate for freedom that you'd pack yourself into a tiny box and trust to Providence and the railroad system. Others follow his example in later years, and some of them die because of it. All of which makes it that much more impressive that this young, 20-something woman escapes on her own. Two of her brothers start out with her, but decide not to go through with it. So she turns around, guides them home, and then strikes back out by herself. That is nothing short of extraordinary. Somebody's calling my name. So let's say we're running with her. What does that look like? There are tricks for evading slave catchers. Only travel by night and stay off the roads. Rub asafetida, an herb that smells a lot like long, unwashed armpit, on your skin to throw off the dogs. Follow the North Star, also called the Drinking Gourd. Always, she knows there are patrols and local groups on the hunt for escaped slaves. Her knowledge of the land must help her. She knows that the rivers around her home run north to south, so maybe she uses that as a guide. There's a lot she never says about her escape to freedom, perhaps because she wanted to protect those who helped her, or just because it was traumatic, an experience she wasn't keen to revisit. Because imagine how perilous this journey was for her. Imagine how heartbroken she must have been to leave her family behind. She would have been out in the elements, living rough a lot of the time. As Arnold Gragston recalled of his own experience, I didn't know what a bed was from one week to another. I would sleep in a cornfield tonight, up in the branches of a tree tomorrow night, and buried in a hay pile the next night. Who to trust on her journey? Members of the Underground Railroad developed all sorts of signs to trade by. Secret owl calls and catchphrases, secret knocks on doors. But often, they were loosely knit and informal networks, which sometimes would shut down or move if things got too hot. Araminta would have had no working knowledge of the geography outside of her immediate vicinity, having lived in the same small area all her life. And she wouldn't have known who was willing to help her and who wasn't. Sometimes people at safe houses will give escapees scraps of paper with information about the next safe house on them. They're meant to verify that the bearer is genuine, not some agent trying to catch those helping fugitive slaves. But since Araminta is illiterate, she can't be sure what it says. All she can hope is that their bearers steer her right. Escaping slaves get out however they can. By rail or boat, wagon or on foot, but mostly that. Despite a few wagon rides, Araminta's journey is mostly on foot, and it's about 80 miles from her plantation to the Pennsylvania line. It would have taken anywhere from 10 days to 3 weeks to accomplish. All of that, knowing that your owner will be looking for you, knowing you would be punished if caught. Who knew what that punishment would be? Whipping, branding, perhaps even hobbling. Every minute must have been an anxious torment. Though I was not a murderer fleeing from justice, I felt perhaps quite as miserable as such a criminal, said Frederick Douglass of his escape by train. The train was moving at a very high rate of speed for that epoch of railroad travel. But to my anxious mind, it was moving far too slowly. Minutes were hours, and hours were days during this part of my flight. And how does Minty feel when she finally makes it to Philadelphia? Does she twirl around in the bright lights of freedom? A little bit, sure. But the reality of freedom isn't the same as the dream. There was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land. She gives herself a new first name to protect her new identity, a symbol of her new life that also honors her family, her past. She takes her mother's name, Harriet, and keeps her husband's last, Tubman. But life in freedom is far from easy. She knows no one in Philadelphia. She has no trade or specific skill set to lean on. As resilient as she is, she's never lived on her own. She finds herself in the same situation as so many who end up on the other side of freedom. Instead of finding ease and safety, she finds herself on a high wire without any security net underneath. And just because she's in the North, it doesn't mean that she's safe. There are fugitive slave laws in place that say that escaped slaves must be returned to their owners, or those who help her will be punished by law. This isn't new. 
fugitive slave laws were written into the Constitution. With several states in the North already free in the 18th century, the Southern Founding Fathers worried that the enslaved would be able to escape up there and disappear. And that's true. More and more people like Harriet get up to cities like Philadelphia, filled with a growing number of abolitionists, where very few people are about to up and tattle. Many resent being told what to do and just refuse to enforce the rules. But that doesn't mean there aren't bounty hunters up in the North looking to cash in on runaways. Even more intense, these laws give some morally black-hearted people incentive to kidnap free black people and sell them off into slavery. Have you seen 12 Years a Slave? You should. It's a true story. Many African Americans like Solomon, escaped and legally free alike, are forced down south and into slavery. Solomon Northup was born a free man, a musician and landowner in New York State, when he traveled down to the nation's capital for work. There he was drugged, kidnapped, and sold into slavery. And there's almost nothing he could do, once caught, because African Americans have no legal standing, no voice, even in Washington, D.C. As Solomon wrote, so we passed, handcuffed and in silence, through the streets of Washington, through the capital of a nation, whose theory of government, we are told, rests on the foundation of man's inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hail Columbia, happy land indeed. But the fugitive slave law of 1850, around when Harriet escapes, takes it to a whole other level. Not only are local Northerners compelled to help with the arrest of escaped slaves, but those African Americans are denied any trial, and anyone who interferes will face a $1,000 fine and six months in jail. Such laws are supposed to help avoid war, but all it does is delay it, and deepen the rift between North and South. A year before Harriet escapes, the country was riveted when some 77 enslaved people stole away through the streets of Washington and hid in the hold of a ship called the Pearl. Those abolitionists sailing it would have to go hundreds of miles to get their charges to freedom. But they're caught in the Chesapeake River, and most of the fugitives are sold down south as a punishment by their owners. And the local abolitionists, helpless, can do nothing. But two girls, young Mary and Emily Edmondson, are saved, but only because a man named Henry Ward Beecher actually raised the money to purchase them from slave traders. The whole thing ignites a fire under the nation and is part of what inspires Harriet Beecher Stowe to write Uncle Tom's Cabin. But for Harriet, this means always looking over her shoulder, living in a climate of fear, suspicion, and doubt. Luckily, she's an industrious sort. While navigating her new landscape, doing odd jobs to make ends meet, she gets involved with local abolitionists. But still, she's lonely. She misses her family. Being free doesn't mean so much when they're still in chains. My home, after all, was down in Maryland because my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and friends were there, she said. But I was free, and they should be free. She's set on liberating them, come hell or high water. And in 1850, the same year as that terrible Fugitive Slave Act, she packs her bag and gets ready to do just that. <music> Meanwhile, Lizzie is persevering. This tall, confident, resilient woman is only becoming a better seamstress. She and her son George are reunited with her mother in the home of Anne Burwell, who's gotten married to a man named Hugh Garland. See you later, terrible Burwell half-sibling! But the Garland's fortunes are failing, and so the family moves to Petersburg, then west to St. Louis, Missouri. They decide to loan Aggie out as a freelance seamstress to try and make some extra money. But Lizzie isn't about to have her long-suffering mother go out and work for strangers. She'd rather work herself down to nothing than see her aging mother do that. So she steps in to take her place. And she makes quite a splash in St. Louis. Her clothes are beautiful, her taste exquisite, her designs refined. It isn't long before she starts attracting the attention of the most fashionable ladies in this moneyed frontier city. She flatters these women with both her tailoring skills and her warm manner, and so she's always in high demand. 
and she makes a lot of money. All of which, of course, goes right back to her owner, Hugh Garland. For several years, her salary supports that guy's entire family, all 17 of them. Get off your ass, Garland! Lizzie is absolutely shaming you. At age 32, Lizzie is proposed to by a free black man. For a long time, she won't marry him, because like all women of color, she knows what that would mean. I could not bear the thought of bringing children into slavery, she wrote, of adding one single recruit to servitude, fettered and shackled with chains stronger and heavier than manacles of iron. This woman is willing to pass on love because she can't bear to condemn a child to the life she was born into. She knows she has to change her circumstances, but how? She goes to Hugh Garland and asks him how much it will cost to buy freedom for her and her son. Garland gives her some cash and says, in sum, Well, the state line's not far away. Illinois is just over the river there. You want to leave? Be my guest. But she doesn't want to face the same fearful life as Harriet, knowing she might be snatched back into slavery at any time. To her, that isn't true freedom. To live like that means never being safe. It's worth noting that Hugh Garland is the lawyer in the famous Dred Scott case in 1857. Dred Scott and his wife lived for years with their master in a free state after he moved there, and thus thought they should be considered free. So they sue the owner, and it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Dred Scott loses because the court declares he isn't a citizen and can't sue for anything. Many call this one of the worst Supreme Court rulings of all time, and I'm tempted to agree with them. If only Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a time traveler. The ramifications of this ruling are huge. It means that no black person, either free or enslaved, is considered a citizen in the eyes of the law. And Lizzie's owner helped make that happen. Yikes. But Lizzie isn't giving up. Eventually, after much pestering, the stab-worthy Garland gives her a number, $1,200. That's something like $34,000 today. But how to make that kind of money when she's giving most of what she earns from her sewing business right back over to Garland? She works for years to try and save up the money. Perhaps Garland set it so high because he thought she never would. Eventually, she decides to go up to New York and pay a visit to a vigilance committee who helps women like her trying to buy their way to freedom. But before Anne Garland will let her go, she asks for insurance, in essence, a bunch of white men willing to sign over that $1,200 in case she runs away and never looks back. Five of her dressmaking clients' husbands sign it, but it's the wives who finally come through for Lizzie. Fabulously named Mrs. Le Bourgeois comes to Lizzie and says that she's had an epiphany. It would be a shame to allow you to go north to beg for what we should give you. And so her clients pay for her freedom. In 1855, she and George are officially free. The earth wore a brighter look, she wrote, and the very stars seemed to sing with joy. But Lizzie isn't about to owe anybody anything. In short order, through her dressmaking business, she pays those ladies every cent right back. She doesn't buy her mother's freedom. We don't know exactly why. All Lizzie says about it in her memoir is that Aggie is old and deeply entwined with the Burwell family. She writes that they were like the sun to her mother, a light she continued to bask in as she'd never known the warmth of any other. Along the road to freedom, she'd married that guy, John Keckley, who turned out to be quite the bum, and a liar to boot. He wasn't actually free, but a fugitive slave. Even worse, he drank like a fish. He didn't make money, he only spent it. So when she gets free, Lizzie isn't keen to save up the money it would take to help him. With the simple explanation that I loved him for eight years, she wrote later, let charity draw around him the mantle of silence. Like Harriet, she takes his name and leaves him behind. Boy, bye! After 30 years in bondage, Lizzie is finally free, and it's time for a new phase of her life to begin. Let's leave our heroines there for now. 
In part two, we'll find out what these intrepid women do with their freedom in the years leading up to the Civil War, as well as through and beyond it. Get ready for tales of boss lady prowess, daring escapes, nursing and spying, intrigue, scandal, and above all, incredible bravery and perseverance. Until next time. Thanks for listening to The Explores. If you liked it, please leave a review on iTunes. Tell your friends about it and spread the word on social media. Every little bit helps the podcast find an audience. For a transcript of this episode, including images and a list of all my sources, go to my website, www.theexplorespodcast.com. That's also where you'll find a list of the excellent music used in today's episode, much of which was recorded in churches, on front porches, and out at work in the fields. Most comes courtesy of the excellent Smithsonian Folkways collection, which you'll also find a link to on my website. For more of the Explores, go to my website and become a patron. For as little as a dollar a month, you'll help me keep making the Explores and get access to hours of exclusive bonus episodes and more. Come see all the pictures I'm posting on Instagram and Facebook to go along with this episode. You'll find me at the Explores Podcast on both platforms. Come find me on Twitter at the Explores Pod. Much love to Paul Gablonski for my theme music and logo. And a huge thanks goes to Kemi Foster, who played Elizabeth Keckley, and Darlene Hope, who played Harriet Tubman. Other vocal stylings by Lulu Picard, John Armstrong, and Phil Chevalier.